there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. in the comfort of our sailing vessel, the Sedna IV, and penetrate far inland on the island of Sumatra, Indonesia. Sumatra is home to an extremely rich and diverse wildlife, with over 200 species of mammals and almost 600 species of birds. Its tropical forests and peatlands are a true global heritage, but the fast economic development based on the exploitation of natural resources today is a disaster for the biodiversity of the island. Located in Southeast Asia, Sumatra is the sixth largest island in the world. The majority of its lush primary forests have been raised in recent decades, giving way to monoculture trees used for paper and palm oil. Today, in what remains of these lush forests, we still find populations of elephants, tigers, rhinos, and great apes. But all these iconic species are now on the sad list of endangered species. The remaining orangutans struggle to survive the impact of deforestation. The loss of these habitats threatens the wildlife populations. And if nothing is done quickly to stop this massacre, 98% of forests could disappear within 20 years. For economic reasons, the majority of Indonesian land was given in grants to companies that decimate these precious forests to make way for the highly profitable palm cultivation. Palm oil, used in food, cosmetics, and biofuels. The vegetable oil most widely used in the world. The forests in the province of Aceh, in the west of the island, are one of the last refuges for populations of orangutans in Sumatra. Despite protective measures dating from the old regime, the new local government has granted new concessions to large corporations, raising and burning forests to convert them into monocultures. These practices are often illegal, but the government turns a blind eye. In this country, laws are often flouted, jeopardizing the survival of the last elephants, tigers, rhinos, and orangutans in Sumatra. Biologist Bryson Voirin, a specialist in arboreal mammals, joins our expedition. Well, I spent a good part of my life in tropical rainforest canopies around the world, in both New World and Old World forests. Now, this forest is especially interesting to me because of the orangutan. Our investigation begins at the SOCP Quarantine Center, the orangutan conservation program in Sumatra. In addition to its many research programs, the SOCP collects the victims of deforestation and animals captured by poachers who resell them as pets. Its director, Dr. Ian Singleton, leads a team of nearly 70 employees. By combining science and education, SOCP hopes to improve the plight of the last orangutans in Sumatra. The best estimates that we have today of the orangutan population in Sumatra is around the, the 6,000, 7,000 mark. Um, maybe slightly more, maybe slightly less. But the, the, you know, the important thing is it's going down. 
Now, in the last sort of 10 years, it's been going down slowly. And uh, what we're looking at now is a potential situation where it's going to start going down rapidly. You know, we're sitting right now at the cusp of potentially a devastating decline in the extent of forest in Aceh and also the orangutans and tigers and elephants and rhinos as well. The SOCP is on a mission to save the last populations of wild Sumatran orangutans, a species critically endangered. Here at the quarantine center, the majority of residents were confiscated from their owners who kept them in captivity, often in inhumane conditions. Upon arrival, the orangutans are examined and treated. The ultimate goal of the SOCP is to release all its residents. But some orangutans will never have that chance. Hey, there you go. Losa was shot 62 times with an air rifle. We've managed to take 14 pellets out of him, but he's still got 48 inside. And he's got the problem, his biggest problem, he's got two in this eye and one in this eye, so he's completely blind. If you, yeah, you can see his eyes, look, there's just nothing there at all. And we'll never be able to fix that. So he's gonna spend the rest of his life as a captive orangutan, which could be more than, you know, could be 40, 50 years. Why would somebody shoot an orangutan 62 times with an air rifle? What you have in, in these farmland areas, you've got people wandering around there with BB guns. And they're, you know, they'll shoot anything that moves. You know, they shoot squirrels and monkeys, anything that they think is gonna eat their crops. And I think that's exactly what's happened with him. They've probably run out of pellets after 62 shots. You, you want to sleep, don't you? You just want to sleep. Huh? So, yeah, these cages behind us are what we call the long-term cages. So that's especially for animals that we know can't be released, at least for the foreseeable future. And, but most of them, the vast majority, after they've done their quarantine down near the clinic and we've treated them for whatever ailments they might, might have, then they move up to these big socialization cages up here. And this is the first time they kind of really start to learn how to be a little orangutan once again. Oh, yeah. you know? So this is, um, you know, these are the socialization cages. So this is the first time They've met and been introduced to other orangutans probably since their mother was killed and they were first captured. So this is where, once they're in here, they have to learn all these orangutan behavioral skills, how to defend their food resources you get. And then you find out who the bullies are and who, who the subordinate ones are and everything else. The aim is to get these groups together where they're all, they all know each other and they all know how to interact with each other. And then we always try and get them into groups so that when they do eventually move to the reintroduction centre, they're not travelling on their own. They're travelling with orangutans that they already know, and they're arriving there with orangutans they know. And oftentimes, some of the orangutans that are out in the forest there, they also know because they were in here a few months ago or something like that. So they all will be released eventually? Yeah, everybody in here is a release candidate. We're just waiting. There's, this Saturday, we plan to move six orangutans from here to Janto to start the release process there. And everybody else is just waiting for their, their turn. But uh, it's quite a rewarding uh, stage to get to because these guys, have many, many of them have spent years on their own. Some of them have even spent like 10 years chained to a single tree around the neck with a meter of chain. And to finally get them into a place like this where they can get really exercise, get to move around, learn all these new skills, uh, it's a really rewarding part of the process. Counting the wild orangutans is a complex task, and the SOCP biologists must travel long distances into the forest to find the nests made daily by orangutans. Often located at the top of trees, it is a daunting task for the patrol. But today, a new technique is being used to better catalog the Indonesian forests. The drones are equipped with high-definition cameras to photograph or film the canopy, where the orangutans spend most of their lives. This new technique allows the SOCP team to work with great efficiency, unparalleled by ground crews. Drones can also be credited with gathering compelling evidence in the case of illegal practices. We started using drones as a tool here 
to try to count orangutan nests to learn more about their distribution and abundance. In the past we used to count orangutans by doing ground surveys, so we go into the forest and go in for a week, two weeks to go to remote areas and, and look how many orangutans there are and if there are orangutans. Now we can fly in with a drone for 10 kilometers, look around, are there nests and come back in an hour. So once you release this, it's going to basically be flying itself, it's an autopilot. It's an autopilot, so we'll do the takeoff manually and then we'll do a few rounds to see if everything is okay and then we'll switch to auto and then it will fly its mission and return and then we'll manually land the plane again. Once we started that we saw the footage and thought that this can be a much more applicable tool than only focusing on orangutans. It gives fantastic information on deforestation, on threats to the forest, on where forest is, what the agricultural threats are, uh, and it gives us, uh, in a way, very high resolution data that we can use to pinpoint where changes are occurring. In their efforts to protect the last wild populations, environmental groups have quickly understood the importance of documenting the logging operations. Drones have now become an effective weapon in the fight to save these last protected areas. The problem is not the oil palm tree. I mean, it's a wonderful, productive uh, plant. The problem is the way the expansion of the industry is happening right now. The droop palm has a much higher yield than soybean or rapeseed. Palm oil is now the most used vegetable oil in the world, and the expansion plans of these monocultures today threatens almost all the forests of Sumatra. The old school uh, plantation industry thought long term. They established a plantation for a hundred years. But the industry currently is being driven by people wanting basically double digit returns in one planting cycle. And I really don't think they care what happens after that. The trees are all cleared, everything is scorched, and 99.999% of everything that lived there dies. You can go into these areas and look for a grasshopper or a lizard, and you can't find one. They're not there. Nothing survives this conversion process. When they're chopping down these forests in the first instance, they don't sort of get every tree on day one. So that every, you, you end up with a few trees here and a few trees there. And sometimes you find there's an orangutan mother up there. So they will chop the tree down and then they will jump on this animal and beat it and club it with machetes and wood and sharpened bamboo sticks and everything and it will be killed that way. Once again, the SOCP team must intervene. An ailing orangutan has been found in a plantation. The wounds sometimes that we see are just horrific. We had one many years ago. She aborted a full-time fetus during, this, during the attack. And when we got to her, she was chained to a tree by the neck. And her entire body was swollen up like she'd just done 50 rounds with Mike Tyson. It was horrible. The level of violence you need to do that, just concerted violence, uh, it just amazes me. I, can't, I find it hard to get it in my head that people can be that vicious. Animals rescued by the SOCP are fortunate, but they only represent a tiny fraction of the orangutan victims of deforestation and poachers. But for others, the majority, 
it will be death, out of sight, through carelessness and indifference. Wow. Wow. So this is the one we got yesterday morning, yeah? Yeah. We just got the information from the forestry department. And then this, he, he said with us, as he found the some orang, big orangutan in the plantation. And the people say the orangutan is just staying in one place and then don't want to move in. And then when try to look in with binocular, he found a lot of wound there. So this is why the forestry department make a decision to take this orangutan going to here. He's got a you know, yeah. big scar this here. This is a lot, of, a lot of wound on his body. He's, uh, on the head, uh, this is very big wound there, and this is very deep. And then we found a big hole on the here. And then on the right hand, is it? he cannot use it. And when we try to pelt it, the scapula is calmed down. Oh, so wow. I don't know exactly is this a fracture or just dislocation. Yeah? So we will make sure with the x-ray. But it's surprisingly calm, yeah? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to see this poor creature come in and just look you in the eyes, and they have the most human-like expressions on their face, and it's just wondering, you know, what the heck is going on and what are people doing to me? The first step is to anesthetize the animal. He will then be taken to the examination room, where x-rays will assess the severity of his injuries. Rhea is an older male. He has not had much luck. His body is covered with bruises and injuries, likely inflicted by plantation workers. Again, the level of violence used reflects the inhumane treatment of these orangutans, who dare to stray into farmland or plantations. The main concern of the veterinarians are Rhea's internal injuries. A comprehensive examination will determine if surgery is necessary. Initial tests confirm that Rhea is in bad shape and that a weapon was used. The x-rays clearly show the presence of projectiles inside the body of the animal. So, yeah, this is the, the head and the skull. You can see there's the one, two, three pellets up there. Three bullets here. One, two, three. So I think there's around 18, yeah. It, it's kind of weird because they usually focus on the head, you know, they usually yeah. shoot them in the face. But these are obviously not too far away from his eyes. If they yeah. hit him in the eyes, they'd have been blinded. Yeah. The full examination confirms the severity of his condition and the presence of significant internal injuries. The veterinary team will have to perform several operations and then wait and see how the animal reacts. We observed the surgical procedures that lasted several hours. It was very extensive, and I think they're gonna have to do more surgery on that animal just to, to keep it surviving for the, the time being. After six hours of the surgery, what's the verdict? Um, it looks from the x-rays, there's no sign of any sort of bone damage. And so his problem is all these, all these cuts and holes. And uh, especially his right hand is completely shot to pieces. The tendons inside the hand is all rotten. You can, again, you can actually put a finger almost all the way in, just about every direction. And the tendons seem to be all already rotten, so you can pull the ends and make the fingers move. So there's a good chance we may have to amputate that, but we'll review that over the next few days. So if you have to cut his uh, right arm, uh, yeah. is there less chance to be released or? It depends on him, but he, he's lived in the forest, wild, and as long as he's sensible, missing a hand probably wouldn't be a major problem. We've, we've already released one big male orangutan with an amputated arm here. 
and it doesn't bother him at all. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. It depends very much on him now, I think. The plight of the orangutan is an eloquent demonstration of the government's inability to protect Sumatran forests and its inhabitants. However, some laws prohibit cutting down forests and conservation areas. But local governments routinely turn a blind eye to illegal acts. In the late 90s, there was this thing called the Losa ecosystem, established by presidential decree and ratified by ministerial decree. And most of the wild orangutans are in the Losa ecosystem, so the future of that species really much depends on that area. And then even more recently, I think in 2008, Losa, the Losa ecosystem was designate, designated a national strategic, air, strategic area for its environmental function, in which you're not allowed to destroy the environmental function of the area. Now this is being completely disregarded by a new spatial plan established and drafted by the, the latest government of Aceh, long after the civil war ended, that essentially opens up the whole of Aceh's forests, including the Losa ecosystem, for new roads, new mines, new logging concessions, new palm oil plantations. And we are terrified about this because the effects on the orangutans is going to be massive. The Loser ecosystem is one of the last havens for orangutans. The SOCP and other NGOs have documented illegal deforestation activities in the area of Tripa, a nature reserve consisting mainly of peatlands. They were able to prove that a company producing palm oil had, on a regular basis, lit hundreds of fires that have killed countless orangutans. A court case was undertaken to condemn this illegal activity. There is no doubt in my mind within the palm oil industry there are better players and worse players and you have a whole spectrum. I'm sure there are companies that you could really say are environmentally responsible. They really are trying to do the, you know, the better thing. And at the far end of the spectrum, the other end of the spectrum, of course, you've got people who really don't give a damn. What we're trying to do is shift the centre of that spectrum up towards the better end, what we think is the better and more sustainable end of the spectrum. I don't think even expansion of the oil palm industry needs cause deforestation. There are huge amounts of degraded land in Indonesia that could be converted into oil palm plantations without any further deforestation. You know, the Ministry of Forestry has two jobs in, on this plate. You know, one is to maximise state revenue from the forests, and the other one is to protect forests and biodiversity. So I think you tend to find that one tends to win out over the other one. And uh, corruption is the other thing. I mean, even when you've got a clear violation of the law, evidence, witnesses, a sort of a, an infallible case, it's still a huge challenge to get something like that into the courts and then to achieve a successful prosecution because corruption is just throughout the system. I would say the vast majority of damage being done is not caused, as a lot of people tend to advocate, poverty. I believe it's caused by greed. It's people that already have something wanting more. What's most surprising when walking in the plantations is the silence of the forest. A deathly silence, reflecting a world without life, artificial and no future. What's changed then in a hundred years of having all these plantations around? Nothing. The money is in Jakarta. It's built shopping malls and new airport for Medan and it's spent in Singapore. And all the, all the plantations in Aceh, you know, the owners of these, uh, are actually living and spending all their money in Medan. It's not staying in the area. The day has finally arrived for some residents of the quarantine center. Today they undertake the long journey to the reintroduction site at Janto, located in the province of Aceh. These orangutans have socialized sufficiently to allow them to interact with other orangutans. They are now ready to be set free 
in a protected area where the SOCP brings together survivors of deforestation collected from all over the island of Sumatra. We're lucky when we're setting up new populations because these orangutans come from all over Sumatra, not just one particular place. So actually, genetically, they would be sustainable and viable with because they're from such a varied background, you know? We wouldn't have to, we don't really need 500 animals here to, gain, to maintain genetic diversity. The road to freedom is a long one for its orangutans. The journey will last 12 hours, in a truck on the road, in 4x4 vehicles on forest roads, or in specially adapted vehicles to navigate the wetlands. Orangutans are always accompanied by veterinarians, thus providing them some comfort during the trip. We also made the journey with them, often in dangerous conditions. The difficulties in accessing the reintroduction site provide some protection for this fragile territory, mainly made up of peatland. Peatlands are a deep peat where all the leaves and trees and branches that have fallen into the water have never rotted because there's no oxygen down there. So you end up with this massive accumulation of carbon under the ground, sometimes 6, 10, 20 meters deep, something like that. Now, if you actually look at Indonesia, I think Indonesia has something like 56% of all the world's tropical peatlands. So the, the amount of carbon considered to be in these peatlands by the experts was something like four to 16 times what's in the atmosphere today. So this is a major issue. If you want to reduce emissions of carbon into the atmosphere, if you can stop destruction of Indonesia's rainforest, and especially its peatlands, you take a huge leap in, in the direction of your goal. If, if we fail to protect these, it has major, major consequences for all of us, not just the people here, but everybody on the planet. After hours of travel, the orangutans finally arrived at the reintroduction center at Janto. They will be examined again and enter the final phase of readaptation before being released in the forest. Mission accomplished. Yeah. This is the bit where we actually get to take a breather. Yeah. It's always stressful when you've got the orangutans on the road because anything can happen, like bridges breaking down yeah. or getting stuck with a broken axle or something. But once you get them here, they're here, they're healthy, they're in the cages, you can relax a bit. Orangutans tend to just sort of grasp it. You know, okay, I'm in a box, uh, let's see where I go. Yeah. I hope over the next couple of days we'll see a few orangutans around here in the trees and, and uh, that's when you get a real kick. So he's feeding, Mukles is feeding them now, but this, this is kind of fruit and veg that we normally get from the markets, just top up their diet. But once they get here in the Janto release site, this, we can start actually collecting fruits and other things from the forest, the stuff that they're going to encounter once they're out. So, um, you know, by doing that, they actually get to taste and experience all these things, and, and then they see what their reaction is before they stuff their faces. Yeah. But I did once follow some orangutans we, we released in another area, and they found these sort of parbs that were half fermented and they stuffed their faces on that and were probably getting more and more drunk and then they spent the whole night throwing up out the side of a nest, you know. <laughs> so they, they've got to learn these things, but at least by just giving them small amounts in the cages, they get to sample these things without eating enough to do themselves any harm. Yeah? And actually, while we've just been talking, orangutan has just climbed up on the cage here. It's just come up now. She's been out two years. Wow, two yeah. years. 
Yeah, she's, I mean, she comes back every few months, and she was here a couple of days ago, but she looks really good. I'm really yeah. impressed. Yeah. The aim of the project here is not to just have a few orangutans wandering free and happy again after a traumatic life. It's to set up a wild, functioning, viable population of an endangered species. And any tourism or disturbance or human contact undermines that. We want these animals to be behaving and acting just like wild orangutans, which means up in the trees, feeding, interacting with each other, and no interference from humans down on the ground. Several of the orangutans released into the wild are equipped with a small subcutaneous transmitter that allows them to be traced and their progress monitored. Well, it's not really far, eh? No, the signal's about 90, so it means it's somewhere within 100, 200 meters max. So, um, but the ter it's difficult to find out exactly where they are because the terrain's quite undulating and the signal bounces around yeah. a lot. But we know it's somewhere in this kind of forest patch here. Okay, let's try to find it. Yeah, okay, let's see if we can get closer. There he is. Let's see if we can get closer. Let's see if we can get closer. There he is. No, up there, look. Oh, yeah. Let's see that gap. You see him pretty clear, yeah. yeah. Sort of yeah. Yeah, yeah, just feel, and then you can hear the the fruit drop. Yeah. Usually when you find orangutans in the forest, if you're not using this stuff, it's uh, mm -hmm. you'd find them with your ears, not yeah. with your eyes. You just hear this as the fruit drops and hits the leaves and stuff like that. And there's a nest right there. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I don't think she's used that one yesterday. That looks like about, about a week old. It's always nice to see them though, yeah? Because yeah. you remember, when you see them like this and you remember when the first time you met, say, Chotti, and it was in somebody's back garden and skinny and terrified and maybe with a chain around its neck. And then you see them out here like this in the tree. It makes you realise, it makes you feel that what you're doing is really worthwhile. You're yeah. really achieving something. Fantastic. And I always get a kick out of it. But not all orangutans are so lucky. At the quarantine center, Rhea is not well. His health is deteriorating, and the medical team must act quickly. So great day for Ruben, eh? Yeah, in a minute, Muklis will sort of, it'll hang a few bits of fruit on the rope there, try and encourage him to go across, and then the last step is just to open the door. Yeah. And then it's up to the orangutan what he does next, yeah? This is what it's all about, yeah? I mean, ever since the first yeah, the orangutans first confiscated and in the medical quarantine and patched up and everything else. It's all about this day where yeah. the door is finally opened and they have that chance mm. of a second life in the wild, which could be another 40, 50 years or so. Yeah. Yeah. So it's fantastic. The door finally opens for Reuben, an orangutan confiscated from its owners and cared for by Ian's team. It's a great day, a day where liberty could finally triumph. He's a little bit unsure about what he's doing, taking a look around. They, a lot of them do that. They, they, they 
you know, the surprise of having the door open is like, ooh, what's going on here? So they don't just immediately run into the trees, but they, they just consolidate themselves for a few minutes and see what's around, see what's where, and then they make a plan. Okay, look, he's off. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. interested in the fruit <laughs> or interested in the tree. So we're very much hands off from the very start. When they come out of the cages, they're not looking for a human contact. They're looking at the trees and seeing other orangutans there and they're going there and they're staying there. There's no difference between these orangutans right now and those orangutans I followed for two years in the swamps. They're up there all the time, feeding very much on the stuff they should be feeding on. And at the end of the day, they made these beautiful nests and went to sleep. Yeni sent me a text, we lost the poor guy. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I didn't make it. But I'm kind of, yeah, disappointed because I was a bit optimistic. I thought when we had, when we had a good look at him the other day, it looks like he, he's still pretty strong. He's been enthusiastic about his food. But I think the injuries that he's got inside uh, are much more than what we saw outside. It's really sad because I thought it was a great, you know, rescue story, you know, yeah. but it was, uh, eating with good appetite and everything, but... Uh... This is another orangutan, dead at the hands of humans, you know? Farmers, villagers, just crazy people. And when they get an opportunity, they just go, just, they just go nuts. Orangutans get killed almost on a daily basis just for nicking a couple of durian fruits or something like that, you know? It's just bizarre. It's completely out of kilter, eh? Crazy. Sad. But we move on. Try and save the other ones. The fate of the last Sumatran orangutan populations depends on the commitment, determination, and passion of people like Ian Singleton and his team. The protection of the last protected forests of Sumatra is of paramount importance to avoid further tragedies such as Rhea. In this unrelenting fight, the SOCP did lose another patient. But the struggle has won an important victory, thanks to the support of other local NGOs and the public, who responded to the appeal by environmental groups. Over the years, I think many NGOs have realized the value of these social networking systems. You know, firstly, websites for getting information out there, but also things like Facebook and Twitter and all the others for getting, you know, getting information out quickly to a large audience. And as a result, we are now able, if we want to launch a quick appeal or request letters or get people to sign a, a petition like the uh, one we did recently on Avaz, to get large numbers of people on board very, very quickly. And the Avaz one in particular, uh, we managed to get something, I think, as much as 1.3 million signatories within just a few weeks. Every time you sign one of these positions, an email goes to the president of Indonesia, it goes to the governor of Aceh, the head of the forestry, and it goes to all these other... So they hate getting 1.3 million <laughs> emails. But it also gets picked up by the press. So it, because of this huge petition, you know, The Guardian, The Independent, The Wall Street Journal, The Sydney Morning Herald, they're all willing to write articles because they know that this is a hot topic. So never underestimate the value of clicking like and share and getting onto these petitions and signing them when, you know, when a cause really is something close to your heart. In a historic judgment, 
The producer of the palm oil, P.T. Kalista Alam, was fined $30 million for fires in Tripa, a valuable peatland area in the Loser ecosystem. This victory is perhaps a consolation prize, however, since a new development plan in the forests in the province of Aceh has been adopted by politicians. Envisioned are more companies, more plantations, and inevitably, more innocent victims. and its remarkable biodiversity is in peril. Species are going extinct faster than at any time in the Earth's history. Rampant exploitation of natural resources is shrinking the habitable areas of the globe. The oceanographic vessel, Sedna IV, is sailing around the world to unveil the beauty and fragility of the planet. Sedna IV and her crew are heading for Sumatra in Indonesia. Sumatra has a rich and varied wildlife with over 200 species of mammals and nearly 600 different species of birds. Located in Southeast Asia, its tropical forests and peatlands are truly a part of the world's heritage. Yet every year, two million hectares of forest are cleared to become vast single crop farms. That's the equivalent of six football fields disappearing every minute. The Indonesian government grants concessions to large corporations who turn these precious forests into plantations. Deforestation is quick and brutal. Animals who try to escape or find refuge in small stands of remaining trees are trapped by fires deliberately set. Though illegal, this murderously destructive practice is widespread. Oil palm plantations are springing up everywhere. The fruit produces palm oil, the most popular vegetable oil in the world. An estimated half of all food on supermarket shelves contains palm oil, to say nothing of cosmetics and biofuels. Ian Singleton is the director of SOCP, the Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Program. Orangutans have become a symbol of the fight against deforestation they are on the sad list of critically endangered species. The best estimates that we have today of uh, orangutan population in Sumatra is around the, the 6,000, 7,000 mark. Um, maybe slightly more, maybe slightly less. But the, the, you know, the important thing is it's going down. Now, in the last sort of 10 years, it's been going down slowly. And uh, what we're looking at now is a potential situation where it's going to start going down rapidly. New concessions have just been granted to palm oil companies in an area that was formerly protected, threatening the survival of the last wild populations. The trees are all cleared, everything is scorched, and 99.999% of everything that lived there dies. You can go into these areas and look for a grasshopper or a lizard, and you can't find one. They're not there. Nothing survives this conversion process. Because when they're chopping down these forests in the first instance, they don't sort of get every tree on day one. So that every, you, you end up with a few trees here and a few trees there. And sometimes you find there's an orangutan mother up there. 
In the first phase of deforestation, some animals find refuge in what's left of the forest. Poachers look for infant orangutans, much to the distress of the females who try to protect their young. So they will chop the tree down and then they will jump on this animal and beat it and club it with machetes and wood and sharpened bamboo sticks and everything, and it'll be killed that way. Most adult orangutans die or are left seriously injured. The young orphans are captured and transported to large centers where they will be sold in secret as pets. The wounds sometimes that we see are just horrific. We had one many years ago. She aborted a full-time fetus during, this, during the attack. And when we got to her, she was chained to a tree by the neck and her entire body was swollen up like she'd just done 50 rounds with Mike Tyson. It was horrible. The level of violence you need to do that, just concerted violence, uh, it just amazes me. I, can't, I find it hard to get it in my head that people can be that vicious. Occasionally, local forest police are alerted and intervene. Wounded animals will then be picked up by SOCP or other NGOs and taken away for medical treatment. But for most of the other orangutans, it's death. Slow, agonizing, lonely, and forgotten. Through its work and research programs, SOCP is trying to save the last wild populations of orangutans in Sumatra. Here at the quarantine station, most residents are young orangutans confiscated from owners who kept them in captivity in often deplorable conditions. The ultimate aim of SOCP is to release all its charges, young and old, into the wild. But not all the animals will be so lucky. Losa was shot 62 times with an air rifle. We've managed to take 14 pellets out of him, but he's still got 48 inside. And he's got the problem, his biggest problem, he's got two in this eye and one in this eye, so he's completely blind. If you, yeah, you can see his eyes, look, there's just nothing there at all. And we'll never be able to fix that. So he's gonna spend the rest of his life as a captive orangutan, which could be more than, you know, it could be 40, 50 years. All the rescued animals have to spend time in quarantine before going to the socialization cages. This is where these young orangutans will learn how to become wild animals again. So this is, um, you know, these are the socialization cages. So this is the first time they've met and been introduced to other orangutans, probably since their mother was killed and they were first captured. So this is where once they're in here, they have to learn all these orangutan behavioral skills, how to defend their food resources you get. And then you find out who the bullies are and who, who the subordinate ones are and everything else. So they all will be released eventually? Yeah, everybody in here is a release candidate. We're just waiting. There's, this Saturday, we plan to move six orangutans from here to Janto to start the release process there. And everybody else is just waiting for their, their turn. But uh, it's quite a rewarding uh, stage to get to because these guys have many many of them have spent years on their own some of them have even spent like 10 years chained to a single tree around the neck with a meter of chain and to finally get them into a place like this where they can get really exercise get to move around learn all these new skills uh, it's a really rewarding part of the process once again SOCP comes to the rescue a wounded orangutan has been found on a plantation. The team must get him to the quarantine station as quickly as possible. The medical team have named him Rhea. He's an older male. Wow. Wow. So this is the one we got yesterday morning, yeah? Yeah. We just got the information from the forestry department, and then this, he, he said with us as he found some orang, big orangutan in the plantation. And the people say 
the orangutan is just staying in one place and then don't want to moving. And then when try to looking with binocular, he found a lot of wound there. So this is why the forestry department make a decision to take this orangutan going to here. He's got a you know, yeah. big scar this here. This is a lot of a lot of wound on his body. He used, uh, on the head, uh, this is very big wound there and this is very deep. And then we found a big hole on the here. And then on the right hand, you see, he cannot use it. And when we try to pelt it, the scapula is calmed down. So I don't know exactly, is this a fracture or just dislocation? Yeah, so we will make sure with the x-ray. But it's surprisingly calm, yeah. 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 <laughs> The first step is to anesthetize the animal. He'll then be taken to an examining room and x-ray to determine the extent of his injuries. Rhea's body is a mass of wounds and bruises, apparently inflicted by the plantation workers. Again, the level of violence indicates the barbaric treatment that awaits any orangutan who dares set foot on cultivated land. Okay. The first x-rays confirm that he's been shot. The pellets can be seen all through his body. So, yeah, this is the, the head and the skull. You can see there's the one, two, three pellets up there. Three bullets here. One, two, three. So I think there's around 18, yeah. But it's kind of weird because they usually focus on the head, you know, they usually yeah. shoot them in the face. But these are obviously not too far away from his eyes. If they yeah. hit him in the eyes, they'd have been blinded, yeah. A thorough examination confirms that Rhea has major internal injuries. He'll need several surgeries and extensive treatment for numerous infections. The medical team will need an ample dose of patience and TLC if they hope to save this wounded fellow. So after six hours of the surgery, what's the verdict? Um, it looks from the x-rays, there's no sign of any sort of bone damage. And so his problem is all these, all these cuts and holes. And uh, especially his right hand, it's completely shot to pieces. The tendons inside the hand is all rotten. You can, you can actually put a finger almost all the way in, just about every direction. And the tendons seem to be all already rotten, so you can pull the ends and make the fingers move. So there's a good chance we may have to amputate that, but we'll review that over the next few yeah. days. So if you have to cut his uh, right arm, uh, is there less chance to be released or? It depends on him, but he, he's lived in the forest, wild, and as long as he's sensible, missing a hand probably wouldn't be a major problem. We've, we've already released one big male orangutan with an amputated arm here, and it doesn't bother him at all. Hmm. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. It depends very much on him now, I think. Rhea will be under 24-hour observation for the next few days. Veterinarians are especially concerned about some of the internal injuries caused by the violent blows he received. He must be carefully monitored throughout his recovery. Orangutans aren't the only victims of deforestation in Indonesia. Another species is the gibbon, a small tree-dwelling monkey that moves with astonishing agility. His characteristic song has become a hymn to the forest, a long lament with which the gibbon defines his territory. The neighboring island of Borneo is also being stripped bare. More than half of its forests are gone, slashed and burned for the profit of palm oil plantations. And recent land concessions could lead to the disappearance of 90% of the remaining forest on the island. Aurelien Brule, known as Shane, left his native France at the age of 18 to settle in Indonesia. He founded Kalawait, an organization for the protection of gibbons. Deforestation on Borneo follows the same pattern. 
In the first stages, poachers target young gibbons to be sold as pets. At his conservation center, Aurelien Brule tries to give gibbons who've been confiscated from the owners a decent life. They now live in large enclosures in the heart of the forest. Throughout the Indonesian archipelago, we estimate there are 6,000 gibbons in captivity. Where do they come from? From the forest. The mother is killed and the baby clinging to her belly is captured. And they become living playthings. They're toys. People play with them for a while, then stick them in a cage where they die. It's sad, but this is increasingly common. More and more animals are being held in captivity because so many are caught during habitat destruction. So the logger moonlights as a poacher. They cut down the forest, leaving a little stand of trees where the gibbons are easy to catch catch, then they sell them. I'm not giving these animals a second chance. I'm giving them a decent life, which they deserve. They didn't choose captivity. They didn't choose to be caught by poachers. It's our duty as human beings. I'm contributing by having these animals serve as wildlife ambassadors to give us the means and the tools to protect those who are still in the trees. It's a global problem and very complex. To protect the last wild gibbon populations, Shani makes regular flights over the great Indonesian forests to track deforestation. He's often able to flush out poachers who go about their business deep in the forest out of sight. One of your essential tools is your paraglider. Yes, it's extremely effective because it takes so little effort. In a single half-hour flight, I can evaluate the situation in a reserve of over a thousand hectares. It would take days on foot to ensure that there was nothing to worry about. I can also keep an eye on areas that are being cleared. This shows a path that was made in the interior. It's the first step before clear-cutting. It's an access to the forest. And there they've started clearing and you can see what's going on. So that's clear-cutting. And they've also set fibers to be able to cut faster. So that forest is on fire. But there must be a risk of the fires spreading. A great risk, but that's actually what they want, to set a fire and burn as much as possible. So it's easier to burn the forest into a plantation. These fires don't get out of control. They are deliberately set to spread as far as possible. That's why there are dozens of fires lit here and there, so as much as possible will burn. The longer the dry season, the happier the oil palm industry is, because they can, unfortunately, convert the forest more quickly. Isn't it against the law? Absolutely. But this goes on every year in Borneo and Sumatra. The haze will even go beyond the country's border. That's how huge the fires are. To counteract the massacre, Callaway was able to negotiate the creation of a protected preserve where they could release their gibbons back to nature. When I created this reserve in Borneo, I did it with the authorities, with the locals. It was an ideal conservation organization. Then came elections. Attitudes and interests changed, and they're now cutting down the forest. What will happen to those animals? This is also a very corrupt country. Indonesia is the fifth most corrupt country in the world, so you have to deal with that. I can't remake Indonesia. My goal is to save Gibbon, save the forest, so I do anything I can to achieve that. I've devoted 11 years of my life to a reserve in Borneo. 11 years of work, money and patrols. Today, as we speak, this forest is being clear-cut. And the orangutans and gibbons who call it home? Sorry. International pressure from many countries forced the hand of the Indonesian government which did eventually set up national parks for the conservation of threatened species. But in the absence of competent authorities in the field, poachers operate freely, destroying any conservation efforts. The Tesonilo National Park was supposed to protect 1,000 square kilometers of forest. Today, around 80% of the park is subject to rampant illegal poaching. On the edges of this park, the WWF has created its Elephant Brigade. When the park was established, the park was already uh, in, in a very bad condition at that time. 
So basically almost like land of nobody. And that's why this encroacher started to come. So the, uh, the encroachers that were already there at that time uh, become even more rampant because they possibly invite more people. And now despite the situation, they still are surviving. Uh, it's, it's now gone and turned into uh, oil palm mainly. It's tough being elephant uh, here in central Sumatra, but despite the situation, they still are surviving. In the heart of this supposedly protected park is more evidence of illegal activity. This is quite amazing. Yes. Who did this? This area, uh, what I heard is, is done by uh, the local people here, They're not far from this area, that they still believe that this area is still part of their customary land. People who are in the field are basically, generally, are just poor people that happen to uh, need some money or uh, just to sustain their life. threat to the survival of endangered species isn't restricted to the period of deforestation. Mature plantations pose their own dangers to survivors of deforestation. A team from the World Wildlife Fund uses GPS monitors to track the movement of some of the wild elephants. This morning, a herd entered a large oil palm plantation alongside another national park. These migratory animals simply don't have enough protected forest left since the parks and reserves are under siege by the poachers. The team needs to intervene quickly to try to settle this new conflict between the wild elephants and the plantation owners. We are just at the limit of Palaraja National Park and we hear farmers who are attempting to hunt elephants off the plantations. The challenge here is that to chase the elephant, uh, you need to uh, direct them to a place that is safe. But here, there is almost nowhere they can go. The oil palm company owners have sent a group of workers to chase the elephants out of the plantation. The battalion, armed with firecrackers, tracks and surrounds the elephants who have nowhere to go. It's an open air circus with the elephants as victims of an organized hunt. The elephants are trying to go here, but there's somebody there again. Yeah. Yeah. Again, there's so many noise here. Yeah. We are living in like, uh, like the war zone. trying to survive despite this kind of situation. Almost every one of them got different kind of scars in their body because they've been tortured here and there. Slowly, 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 run up. And now we are safe. The 
elephants were able to get away from the first plantation, but are now being subjected to repeated attacks by workers at the next plantation over. Look, you know, they're right in the middle of the two plantations and they don't know where to go. Yeah. Different people chasing from different yeah. directions, so they must be really confused. The plantations have become war zones where owners can do as they please. The elephants simply no longer have enough protected habitat to survive. National parks have been reduced to almost nothing and the Indonesian government continues to close its eyes to flagrantly illegal activity. Many elephants die every year, poisoned for having breached the borders of plantations. There are only a few hundred Sumatran elephants left in this part of the island. The Indonesian government's inability to protect its parks and reserves leaves conservation groups with few alternatives. Sa, that was the end for me. Now I don't take risks. I buy the land. If I'm permitted to under Indonesian law, now that I'm a citizen, I will buy up as much as possible. Even if in terms of conservation, I'm not sure it's the best option. But if we want to be as certain as possible that we can save the forest, we have to buy patches of forest, create private conservation zones. With a thousand euros, we can save one hectare. A family of gibbons needs 15 hectares. 15,000 euros will save a gibbon family forever. That is very concrete. And if we own the forest, we can put protection measures in place without having to seek authorization from any elected official who may change every five years or lobby authorities for which there is never a guarantee. This is completely different. Someone cuts down a tree on my reserve, it's as if someone came into my house to rob me. I call the local police who do their job. Welcome to Kalawit, Sumatra. From the high point of his reserve, we observe the morning spectacle of a family of wild gibbons free on land rich in a variety of species, in the heart of a parcel of forest protected by Kalawait. It's wonderful because looking down, you can see wild animals, which is almost impossible when you walk through the forest. Yes, it's one of the few places where you can observe wild gibbons at eye level. This is a family of five. And it's great because the male has light-colored fur and the female is black, so you can see patches of color moving through the forest. That young one seems pretty lively. Yes, that's typical of Gibbons. He's almost two, still close to his mother, but he moves around on his own, jumping around to the annoyance of his parents. What's amazing is to see that the work you do with the cages, with conservation, now allows you to buy sections of forest to protect it. Yes, thanks to the animals you hear in the background singing in their cages, I can protect the wild ones. This is why I came to Indonesia, to see wild gibbons and protect them. And we're doing just that here at Kalawait Reserve, the forest we bought. I can touch that goal with my fingertips. Saving gibbons means saving trees, which saves all the animals. We have no time to lose, and the best way to proceed is to buy up the forest. In Indonesia, the first big victory, and we have the necessary tools to win it, is to ensure that zones protected under Indonesian law, all the existing national parks, all the existing reserves, are well and truly protected on the ground. We have the tools we need, the laws on our side. National parks and reserves have already been created. But it's clear to see that in Indonesia, the way the law is enforced is not what people are used to in developed countries. The Kalawait Foundation relies entirely on donations from the public. 
will Shani's plea reach into our homes, where we consumers of palm oil can make a difference? Bowing to international pressure, a group of growers teamed up to produce certified sustainable palm oil. But it's a fraction of the world's supply, and some NGOs doubt the honesty of certain producers. Yet respect for habitat and biodiversity ought to be a basic condition of earning the right to exploit the forest anywhere on the planet. The fight against palm oil is crucial, not just for the forest of Indonesia, which unfortunately is already severely affected by palm oil. Anything we can save in Indonesia is only a first step. But if we don't organize a defense, an offense against palm oil, then the industry will start the same process of destruction in Central Africa, in Gabon, especially which is renowned for its lush forest. The oil palm corporations are already there, and in Latin America. That's why it's vital to have victories here, so that the pattern doesn't repeat so severely in other countries where palm oil exploitation is in its infancy. Just look at what's happened in Malaysia, which was one of the first countries targeted by palm oil and where little forest is left. Deforestation accounts for 20% of greenhouse gas released into the atmosphere every year, which is a major contributor to global warming. The big day has arrived for some residents of the quarantine station. Today, they set out on the long journey to the Janto reintroduction site in Aceh province. They're now ready to be set free in a protected area where the SOCP places survivors of deforestation gathered from all over Sumatra. The fact that the release site is so hard to reach offers some protection to this fragile area, mostly made up of peatland. Peatlands are deep peat where all the leaves and trees and branches that have fallen into the water have never rotted because there's no oxygen down there. So you end up with this massive accumulation of carbon under the ground, sometimes 6, 10, 20 meters deep, something like that. Now, if you actually look at Indonesia, I think Indonesia has something like 56% of all the world's tropical peatland. the amount of carbon considered to be in these peatlands by the experts was something like four to 16 times what's in the atmosphere today. So this is a major issue. If you want to reduce emissions of carbon into the atmosphere, if you can stop destruction of Indonesia's rainforest, and especially its peatlands, you take a huge leap in, in the direction of your goal. If we fail to protect these, it has major, major consequences for all of us, not just the people here, but everybody on the planet. After traveling for hours, the orangutans at last reach the Janto Release Center. They'll be re-examined and then enter a final adaptation stage before being released into the forest. Mission accomplished. Yeah. This is the bit where we actually get to take a breather. Eh? Yeah. It's always stressful when you've got the orangutans on the road because anything can happen, like bridges breaking down yeah. or getting stuck with a broken axle or something. But once you get them here, they're here, they're healthy, they're in the cages, you can relax a bit. Orangutans tend to just sort of grasp it. You know, okay, I'm in a box, uh, let's see where I go. You know? Yeah. But not all orangutans are so lucky. At the quarantine station, Rhea, the big male, badly beaten by plantation workers, is in trouble. He stopped responding to treatment, and his condition is deteriorating. The medical team needs to perform more surgery if there's any hope of saving his life.
great day for Ruben, eh? Yeah, in a minute, Muklis will sort of, it'll hang a few bits of fruit on the rope there, try and encourage him to go across, and then the last step is just to open the door. Yeah. And then it's up to the orangutan what he does next, eh? This is what it's all about, yeah? I mean, ever since the first, the, the orangutans first confiscated in the medical quarantine and patched up and everything else, it's all about this day where yeah. the door is finally opened and they have that chance mm. of a second life in the wild, which could be another 40, 50 years or so. Yeah. So it's fantastic. At long last, the cage door slides open for Reuben, a young orangutan confiscated from his owners and treated by Ian's team. It's a great day, one everyone's been working towards, a day when freedom triumphs. Obviously, a little, little bit unsure about what he's doing, taking a look around. They, a lot of them do that. They, 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 you know, the surprise of having the door open is like, ooh, what's going on here? So they don't just immediately run into the trees, but they, they just consolidate themselves for a few minutes and see what's around, see what's where, and then they make a plan. Okay, look, he's off. Oh, now, yeah. Isn't he? Oh, yeah. interested in the fruit, <laughs> or interested in the tree. We're very much hands off from the very start. When they come out of the cages, they're not looking for a human contact. They're looking at the trees and seeing other orangutans there, and they're going there, and they're staying there. There's no difference between these orangutans right now and those orangutans I followed for two years in the swamps. They're up there all the time, feeding very much on the stuff they should be feeding on, and at the end of the day, they made these beautiful nests and went to sleep. Yeah, and he's sent me a text, we lost the poor guy. So, yeah, I didn't make it. But I'm kind of, yeah, disappointed because I was a bit optimistic. I thought when we had, when we had a good look at him the other day, it looked like he was still pretty strong. He's been enthusiastic about his food. But I think the injuries that he's got inside uh, are much more than what we saw outside. It's really sad because I thought it was a great, you know, rescue story, you know, yeah. but it was, uh, eating with good appetite and everything, but... Uh, this is another orangutan, dead at the hands of humans, you know? Farmers, villagers, just yeah. crazy people. And when they get an opportunity like that, they just go, just, they just go nuts. Orangutans get killed almost on a daily basis just for nicking a couple of durian fruits or something like that, you know? It's just bizarre. It's completely out of kilter, eh? Yeah. Sad. But we move on, try and save the other ones. the privilege to work with this magnificent species, including uh, elephant, tigers, and rhinos. And they are categorized as critically endangered under IUCN criteria. All of these uh, species or subspecies are in that category now. The next step beyond that is extinct in the wild, and we really don't want them to be there. Oh, 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 oh,
I can't imagine anyone thinking Callaway is a solution. It's often presented as such. Yes, we're doing amazing work, but we won't save the gibbon. Not the gibbon. We're saving some gibbons. And there's a huge difference. We're not saving the forest. We're saving bits of forest, fragments, pockets. But if we don't do it, we'll lose everything. So we have to do it. Maybe there'll be a study in 30 years in Borneo and we'll have saved 2% of the forest. Yeah, but it's not all gone. We have to focus on that, because if we don't act now, if nothing is done, we'll lose everything.